And I've said to the guys, gentlemen, we're here, we're in this together. We're going to work together to stay awake. And if you have any problem with that, I got some assistance here in this bucket to keep people awake. And just looking at that bucket for the entire message, I think, was a means of grace <laughs> to men to keep them awake. Uh, I had no bucket this time, but I got a, there was a wingback chair in my room that I found to be edifying, and maybe we'll talk about it a little later, but that's just perched on the stage for that reason. But we can stay awake. I, I was on a plane flight about three weeks ago from Chicago to Seattle, and there was a Navy SEAL training film that I watched, and one of the elements was these guys hadn't slept for 72 hours, and they were all sitting on a beach together holding each other's arms, and they were singing together trying to help keep each other awake. So they were doing it for the cause of becoming a Navy SEAL. We do it for the cause of our king, who is worthy for our giving it all, right? Whatever we do, we do it with all of our might. Whether we eat or drink or we listen, we can listen with all our might because he is worthy. So let's work together as a band of men seeking to glorify our Savior. And one more thing I'll have to keep you awake. It's the passage I'm going to read. It's Song of Solomon chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. Just turn there if you've got your Bible. Song of Solomon 4, 1 through 7. And there's this certain element in this that might keep us awake in a special way. We're talking about uh, how the exhilaration of encouragement, that was our first session, the expressions of encouragement are second session, and now we want to talk about the family implications of encouragement. So the text I'll bring is Song of Solomon 4, beginning at verse 1. How beautiful you are, my darling. How beautiful you are. Your eyes are like doves behind your veil. Your hair is like a flock of goats that are descending from Mount Gilead. Your teeth like a flock of newly shorn ewes which have come up from their washing, all of which bear twins. Not one among them has lost her young. Her lips are like a scarlet thread, and your mouth is lovely. Your temples are like a slice of pomegranate behind your veil. Your neck is like the Tower of David, built with rows of stone, of which are hung a thousand shields, all the round shields of the mighty men. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of the gazelle, which feed among the lilies until the cool of the day, when the shades flee away. I will go away to the mountain of myrrh, to the hill of frankincense. You are altogether beautiful, my darling. There is no blemish in you. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Our Father, we, we think of the family implications of encouragement and we think of our brides whom we need to encourage and we ask that you would give us insight in this last session together give us your holy spirit we pray in jesus name amen there's this uh british period drama set in the early 20th century downton abbey anybody ever see downton abbey anybody <laughs> I, I watched a lot of it with my, with my wife. And there's an account there where a guy named Mr. Drake comes down with a case of congestive heart failure. And it becomes a patient of a small town doctor, Dr. Clarkston. And it looks like Mr. Drake is going to die. He's got three children. They're going to be fatherless. But Isabel Crawley, who is the assisting nurse, says, I've heard of a new technique in dealing with congestive heart failure patients, and it involves the use of adrenaline. And so they order a vial of adrenaline from London, and they begin the procedure. The doctor pierces Mr. Drake's chest cavity, 
and an enormous needle begins to quickly drain off pints of heart-drowning fluid, and as expected, the heart induces into a cardiac arrest, and Mr. Drake's heart stops beating. And then the nurse calmly hands to Dr. Clarkston a syringe of adrenaline, and that syringe of adrenaline is ejected directly into the heart area, and then the adrenaline acts as a cardiac jump starter, and Mr. Drake almost instantly springs into a healthy heartbeat again. You see, it was adrenaline that was the health, life-restoring invigorator, and the entire Drake household was the beneficiary. And in the story, it's Mrs. Drake who makes the call. Yes, give him the adrenaline. And so encouragement, as I say, is like adrenaline. And in healthy households, it shouldn't just be used as some exotic delicacy, but the adrenaline of encouragement should be on tap and a part of the daily family diet because encouragement brings a healthy pulse to the whole household, and that's what I want to consider this hour, the family household implications of encouragement. And we'll have three main headings, encouragement for husbanding, encouragement for fathering, and yeah, for you gray heads like me, encouraging for grandfathering. Let's go to the first of the three main headings, encouragement for husbanding. Uh, a famine of encouragement can bring a marriage to the point of cardiac arrest. There's an article in Atlantic Magazine called Masters of Love, and it reported on four decades of research that the psychologist John Gottman conducted on thousands of couples to discover what makes relationships work. It was the renowned Gottman Institute that engaged in this study. They set up a love lab and they brought in newlyweds and hooked them up to electrodes and then asked them to discuss the health of their relationships. And during their discussion, the electrodes measured the couple's blood flow and heart rate and sweat production. Then the couples went home and researchers contacted those couples six years later to find out if they were still married, and what was the condition of their marriage. And as the researchers studied the data they gathered, they found two distinct groups. There was, on the one hand, the masters. On the other hand, there were the disasters. You see, the, the disaster had appeared six earlier to be calm during their interviews, but the electrodes recorded something different in their physiology. Quote, their heart rates were quick, their sweat glands were active, their blood flow was fast. You see, the couples who demonstrated a more active physiology were more aggressive toward each other. And they, quote, showed signs of being in fight or flight mode. Continuing, conversing with their spouse was, to their bodies, like facing off with a saber-toothed tiger. And their relationships were disasters because they deteriorated really quickly. But on the other hand, there were the masters. And the masters, in their assessment physiologically in the diodes, they were, they were calm and they were not only calm outwardly, but also physiologically. They, they, were, they were loving and they were warm toward each other. Even in times of conflict, they discovered, after six years, they realized those were the masters. And the summary was this. There's a habit of mind that the masters have, which is this. They are scanning their social environment for things that they can appreciate and say thank you for. They're building this culture of respect and appreciation very purposefully. The disasters, on the other hand, were scanning the social environment for their partner's mistakes. See, the disasters had the hawk eye for what was bad in their partner but the bat's eye for what was good. And just finally, the Gottman Institute said this, it's not just scanning the environment, it's scanning the partner for what the partner is doing right or what the partner is doing wrong and then criticizing versus respecting him 
and expressing appreciation. Contempt, they found, is the number one factor that tears couples apart. So people who are focused on criticizing their partners miss a whopping 50% of the things that could be commended, and then they find things negative in elements that really aren't even there. That's the Love Lab summary. Now, I will admit that this summary convicts me as being guilty as a husband. Just to dial back in my diary, when I married Diane back in 1982, our delightfully memorable honeymoon, at least it was supposed to be delightfully memorable, was stained with a lot of conflict. First of all, gentlemen, she spent so much time saying farewell to her sisters and to her bridesmaids that we left the marriage destination, headed to the honeymoon rendezvous destination two and a half hours late. And to a newly married man, that was a significant dimension to me. And I was a little upset about this, and I criticized her for it. And then, then when we selected the restaurant that we chose in Niagara Falls, uh, it wasn't the one I wanted, because that's what she wanted. And I remember being in Toronto. We were going to go to the CN Tower in Toronto, and you've got to diagonalize your way toward the CN Tower. So I had her in my hand, and I was leading her, but she wanted to go the other way. <clears throat> And there was this constant tug of war going on. And I sat her down on a flowery boulevard bench there in Toronto. And I said, honey, I am the leader in this relationship. I wanted to make sure that she was set straight early on. Then we got to Stratford, Ontario. And we had some argument about the Shakespearean play that we saw, we quarreled about things I can't even remember about. The bottom line for me was that I perceived my Diane's flaws as if I were Mr. Perfect myself. They were flaws and I was going to fix them by criticizing her and correcting her. And I prided myself in one, transparency, and in two, confrontation. Because I was a man who would speak the truth. Not so much in love, though. Well, it was 1982, <clears throat> and fast forward ahead, 19 years later to 2001, I told you about my dad dying at 71. Where's Mac? Mac, yeah, you're 70 years old. My, my, when my dad was 71, he said, I'm living on my bonus year. Well, he died on his bonus year at age 71, and I was stunned, I was staggered, I was saddened by the great loss. And the brevity of life just smacked me right in the face. And I would get up at like 2 o'clock in the morning. And I had like a dagger in my heart because my dad was my man. He was my hero. He was so much to me. And I'd look at Diane, this woman that I could have a tendency to, to circle around her like a vulture and to criticize things in her life. And I just mused at that point regarding the brevity of life. Am I wise to spend the precious few moments that Diane and I have together in our fleeting little lives, just circling around her perceived quirks and flaws? And it was there I said, Mark, come on, come on. Life is short. Let it go. Let it go. Don't obsess on her blemishes. Bask in her virtues. And you know what? That night, I made a quantum leap forward in wise and loving husbanding. Now, Paul tells us regarding husbands, it says they're to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. They are to, look, it says in 5.28, they're to love their wives, listen, as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Now, can you ever read a little Charles Hodge, Systematic Theology? He's kind of craggy, but still, he's got some really good stuff. He perceptively writes this on this passage. Listen, he says, Marital love, therefore, is as much of a dictate of nature as self-love. And just as it is unnatural for a man to, to hate his wife, it's as unnatural for a man to hate his wife as it would be for him to, to hate himself, to hate his own body. Hodge goes on. 
A man may have a body which he does not altogether think suits him. He may wish it were a handsomer body, a wealthier, a healthier body, a stronger body, a more active body, but still it is his body. It is himself. And he nourishes that body and he cherishes that body as tenderly as though it were the best and loveliest body a man ever had, Hodge says. And so Hodge goes on and says, and so a man may have a wife whom he could wish to be better, more beautiful, more agreeable, but still she is his wife. And by the constitution of nature and the ordinance of God, she is a part of himself. In neglecting or abusing her, he violates the laws of nature as well as the law of God. And thus it is how Paul presents the matter. Now, I think of my own scarred and blemished and, and odd-looking and flawed body. I mean, come on, realistically, Jason, look at this nose. You know, a big ball at the end of it, disproportionately long, but it's my nose. And when I have a respiratory issue or a cold, I pamper that nose as if it were the finest nose in the world because it's my nose. And so, as our bodies get daily pampering and primping, so we ought to daily pamper and primp our wives. Like it says in 1 Corinthians 13, we are to love them. What? Love endures all things. So contrary to my honeymoon posana. Love is kind. It, it does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. It doesn't act rudely. It doesn't seek its own. It's not easily provoked. It thinks no evil. It doesn't rejoice in iniquity. It rejoices in truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And gentlemen, I'm not the only guy in the room with the problem. We need to love our wives as Christ loved the church, loving her as our own bodies. Because my Diane is like an exquisite and delicate Voss who deserves my honoring and polishing and encouraging and not my belittling and rough handling and criticizing. Husbands, dwell with your wives according to knowledge as the weaker vessel, delicately handling her. So gentlemen, after lunch, I'm talking to you. Pay attention to me. For husbands, there's still a place for loving confrontation to be sure. But gentlemen, most of us, we need to dial it down. We need to pick our battles. we got to take on the personality of a Barnabas encourager and put off the persona of a devilish fault finder who's always accusing the brethren day and night. Husbands should be Proverbs 31 husbands. What does it say about that Proverbs 31 husband, about that woman? It says, her children rise up and call her blessed, and her husband, what does it say about her husband? And he also praises her. Is that what you're known for? Are you known for praising her? Steve, you're known for praising your wife? It ought to be that fact. Now you may say, well, I do praise her. But I say, could it be that you may praise her, but with an eyedropper, when you should really praise her with a garden hose? Some of us can be really stingy with our praise. You see, what we need to do is take a page out of Solomon's husbanding manual there. Did you see that chapter section I read in Song of Solomon 4, 1 through 7? Notice how Solomon is so, so heavy on affectionate and affirming encouragement. We, we should be able to find the good in our wives and overlook the not-so-good in our wives. Did you see what I read there in Song of Solomon? Solomon is the exemplary groom. I think it's kind of a love manual. And Solomon, we see, is extravagant in, in loving his bride with words of encouragement and compliment and affirmation. He, he doesn't praise her with an eyedropper, not even with a garden hose. He praises her with a fire hose. And we ought to be willing to slap it on thick. It says in 115 of the Song of Solomon, Behold, you are fair, my love. 
Behold, you are fair. You have dove's eyes. Or, and by the way, even in the typology of all this, the, the hermeneutics class, Jeff, you talked about, talked about Song of Solomon, typology. This is Christ's love for his bride, for his people. Notice how the groom speaks. Your teeth, well, 1.5 says, you are fair, my love. Behold, you are fair. You have dove's eyes. Or 4.2, it says, look there, your teeth are like a flock of shorn sheep which have come up from the washings, every one of which bears twins. None of them is barren among them. See, Solomon uh, rejoices in the fact that his wife still has all her teeth. And 3,000 years ago, this was a significant beauty mark on one's wife. A stunning feature. You see, Solomon here is ever scanning her life for things worthy of his appreciation. And then he verbally expresses what it is about her that absolutely delights him. Is that you, Steve? It's not my default setting, but I've learned since my dad died in 2001. It says in 6 9, You are fair, my love. There is not a spot in you. My dove, my perfect one. No one is like you. I'll even admit to you guys, you know, I, just because you preach on this doesn't mean you got it all together. I left Holland at 4.30 in the morning yesterday, and I had had a tiff with my Diane. Jeff, you ever have a tiff with your wife? Okay, I, I left with a tiff with my wife, and when I get home, I have some uh, home improvement that I need to engage in. And so I am, I am struck with this. I'm, I'm, I'm so much, uh, the tiff isn't nearly as deep as it was in the past, but I find that I, I still limp in the ways of godly husbanding when I should be running in the ways of godly husbanding. I, I still remember a few years ago after my insights, I remember Diane had gotten away for a couple of days and she'd spent some time with her sisters uh, Darius in Chicago, of all places. You can spend a lot of money in Chicago, you can. <laughs> but, you know, you, you ever have that? Your, your wife goes away. I mean, some of you guys have five, six, seven kids. Your wife goes away. Yeah, we, I'll take care of them, honey. No, get away. Enjoy your time away, you say. And bold and brave, and we, we look out the picture window as she drives down the driveway and heads off to the west. But then what happens, Alan? You know what happens. After a couple, three hours, you start walking by the picture window. When is she, when is she coming back? And, and uh, I still remember she, she came back from that Chicago trip, and I said, oh, man, honey, it is so good to have you back. You, you, you are the Mary Poppins of our family. And, and w without you, our technicolor life is like a black and white movie. And to be able to express things to her, isn't it true? Like Eve, I call her the giver of life. To us. She's, she's the Eve, the one who really who pulses life into our family. Uh, there's a flower and garden show in Grand Rapids that you can listen to. And uh, there's a point where a husband shouts to his wife, you can't go! It's kind of a divorce situation. You can't go! All the plants are going to die! And I tell Diane, Diane, you are the one who keeps, who keeps the plants alive in our family. Isn't that true regarding our wise men? Don't, don't they bring the technicolor to our souls? And we ought to tell her about this. So that's just that element of encouragement in husbanding. But come on, secondly, now, how about, how about encouragement in fathering? Encouragement in fathering. A couple of passages just to think. Encouragement in fathering. It's really significant because we can have a Scrooge-like persona in the way that we father our children. And that's why it says in Ephesians 6, 4, fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath. I know you want excellence in them, fathers, but don't provoke your children to wrath. Or Colossians 3, 21, fathers, don't exasperate your children, lest they what? Lose heart. And so just, just, just ponder, ponder this idea of encouragement in father. Remember James Dobson? 
focus in the family? Dobson, in an old book, he, he, he reminisced about his dad's perfection. He says this, he says, I remember working with my dad one day in the backyard when I was 15 years old on a day when he was particularly irritable for some reason. He just crabbed at me for everything I did, even when I hustled. And then finally he yelled at me for something, and I considered that petty, and I just threw the rake down and I quit. I, I walked off. I, I walked across our property, down the street, when my dad demanded that I come back. It was one of the few times in my life that I ever took my dad on. Well, I remember walking around town for a while and wondering about what would happen when I finally went home and ended up at my, my cousin's house on the other side of town. And after several hours there, with my knees quaking, I called home and Dad said, stay there, I'm coming over. And to say I was nervous was an understatement. And in a short time, Dad arrived and he asked me to talk alone with him. And he said, Bo, Bo, I didn't treat you right this afternoon. I was, I was riding your back for no good reason. And I want you to know, Bo, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And your mom and I want you to come home. And Dobson says, that was really difficult for my dad. But my dad made a friend for life that day with the way that he treated me. Now, I wish I could say that critical, crabby irritability never stained my fatherhood. But I know that it has. In fact, it's a besetting fault for not a few dads. But you know, the, the keynote, the keynote of fathers shouldn't be critical irritability. The keynote, gentlemen, of fathers should be encouraging harmony. That should be the keynote of our fathering. When you, you have a keynote for a piano, right, that, that everything is to emanate from it. And think of the keynote of fatherhood for us. Think of the, the first recorded words between our Heavenly Father and His beloved Son. They're really full of significance. It says in Matthew 3 that when, when Jesus had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, the Jordan River, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him, and suddenly a voice came down from heaven. What does it say? This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. This is the first time we behold the, the incarnation of Father-Son love, and we see there's a certain keynote to it. And, and there's a world of information about fatherhood that, that these two brief verses show us. We see that when it comes to Jesus' baptism, we see first what? The Father was there. <laughs> That's significant for us. Also, He made His presence felt by the Spirit's symbolism. Also, He made His presence known by speaking to Him. And the words were, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. Look, the father in that keynote to our fathering expressed what in his son? Pleasure. Pleasure between the father and the son. So the first thing we're told about the relationship between the father and the son is that the father thought that his son was doing a good job. Strange as it may sound, that is the keynote to our fathering. This is the, the tuning fork. This is by which we should rate our own fathering. This is what ideal fatherhood sounds like. Just listen to the sweet harmony between father and son. Pleasure. This is the pitch. Well pleased. You hear it? With whom I am well pleased. And when you know, when we don't match that pitch, gentlemen, a lot of things are going wrong. I know what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, but come on, Mark. This is the, the father, and he had the perfect son. And he said of him, with you I am well pleased. You know the piece of work I got is my son back home. You'll be sitting here staring at me. Yeah, I got that. But you know the piece of work that your heavenly head, father has with you sitting in that tan chair? You know what a piece of work you are? But what is he going to say? Because I, I told you in the beginning that he so lavishes love on you that you are called a son of God. 
You are a child of God. And you know what he's going to say to you at the end of your life when you face him? Matthew 25, parable of the talents. What's he going to say to you? Well done, good and faithful servant. He's going to have a bat's eye for the bad things. And he's going to have a hawk eye for the good things. And that's the way it ought to be with you dealing with your own sinful son. You ought to have that kind of a pitch and tone. I ought to have it with my fathering. Sure, sure, sure. Sure, fathers must reprimand and rebuke and discipline. No doubt about it. It says in Hebrews 12, 8, Without discipline, no one would be an, a legitimate child, for it's illegitimate child who have no father who disciplines. But, gentlemen, we need to resist our tendency to be excessive fault finders. And in training our children to strive for excellence, we can't become abrasive, white glove, reprimanding drill sergeants, critically evaluating constantly. See, that, that's me. That, 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 that's me and my sinful default setting. I, I can, over the years, I look at my kids and I can whisper under my breath, you know, she speaks with a bit of a lisp. You know, he can't yet tie his shoes so they'll stay. You know, his hair is all wrong. You know, he, slept, he sleeps in too long. He, he mowed the grass in the wrong configuration. As if there is one way to mow three acres of property, right? There is, Lee. You and I are, are kindred spirits on this, right? Or how about this? She doesn't sit ladylike. Or he mumbles instead of speaking clearly. Or he bought jeans with the wear mark already on them. <laughs> or he talks with food in his mouth. Or he puts way too much syrup on his waffles. Or his sense of humor isn't nearly as witty as the neighbor boys. See how petty I can be? In the way that I look at my children, I want perfection. And like Dobson's dad's, fathers can be constantly badgering and nitpicking. Can't we, gentlemen? And that's why it says, fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath. Don't do it. And fathers, don't exasperate your children lest they lose heart. Gentlemen, a sour tone that's provoking and exasperating is relationally corrosive. Oftentimes, we can hear it when we observe other fathers relating to their children, but sometimes we don't hear it in ourselves. There's a particular man, it's a fellow pastor, and it was years ago, and I would, I would hear it. I would hear it in the, the way that he related to his son, and I watched it. I didn't say anything about it, and the fruit of it is really ugly because that son went off into the far country. And I'm so thankful for my wife, my Abigail of a woman, who remember Abigail stood and opposed David. There are times when my wife, like an Abigail, was, honey, let's, let's go talk in the bedroom. And maybe that's how we have tiffs, huh? <laughs> my wife. Because she is faithful to me. Profuse with the kisses of an enemy, faithful are the blows of a friend. Honey, honey, you're really being corrosive in the way that you're dealing with them. And instead of sometimes I want to utilize the nuclear option with this child. And Diane makes me wise to do otherwise. And when I've been rutted in this corrosive, critical spirit, Diane has thrown me a rope out of my slough to pull me out. And I'm so thankful for my bride. In fact, uh, Sam Crabtree has a book on In Praise of Affirmation. Good book. And, and he tells of lecturing at a seminar to a Campus Crusade staff on the benefits of building up others by praise and affirmation. And during the second session, there was a guy who was sitting up here in the, in the front row like where Jeff is sitting. And he was really paying attention really well after the first, during the first session. Then second session, chair's empty. And, and Crabtree kind of wondered, what, what did I offend, Jeff? And then uh, after that second session, the Jeff guy came over and said, hey, I, I just want you to know that uh, I, I missed the session. But I'll, I'll read what the guy said to Crabtree. He says, hey, I'm so sorry I missed that second session. But after you talked about praising and affirming, 
I went to the phone. I got this 14-year-old son, and he hasn't spoken to me for about two years. And we used to fight about almost everything. And over time, the fighting dissolved into a long, silent, uneasy truce. And after being convicted by this teaching on affirmation of that first hour, I called him on the phone. And I was resolute that I wasn't going to criticize or correct him about anything, but instead I was going to praise him. Because I do, I do see seeing things in him that are commendable. Well, this son, who hasn't said boo to me in two years, he talked with me for 45 minutes. And I wasn't going to hang up, and that's why I missed that second session. You see, gentlemen, encouragement, it is like adrenaline. It can take a dead relationship. Maybe somebody here, maybe there's one person who's got a dead relationship at home. And you need that syringe of, of adrenaline, of encouragement to, to pump into it. Well-timed doses of it spur children on to maturity by putting away childish things and pursuing manhood and womanhood. That's what we really want. So, so think about it, gentlemen. Let's say that. Let's say you get home this afternoon. And maybe while you were gone, your son spontaneously washed the van. An unthinkable thing. And you go out, you do the inspection, you see, man, he missed a, about a, about a seven-inch slash right along the quarter panel. <laughs> it is not time to point out the blemish in the job. It is point to look for things that can be praised. It's not appropriate to nitpick. You see, we want them, men, to daringly reach. And common sense teaches us that if we slap their hand every time they attempt, they'll be gun-shy even to try. I'm Scott, I'm looking at you in a sense. Man, you're a football coach. Uh, I don't know, I just think of high-driving testosterone guys. You may have an issue like I have with this. And maybe you and maybe Lee over there or Steve, maybe you too. Got issues. I don't know what's going on. I'm just, I'm just shooting in the dark here in Texas. So, so just, just ponder the implications of this. I can remember back in my mid-teen years when I worked at a golf pro shop for an elite country club. Uh, Don was the assistant pro of the country club. Don was 6'5". He had this intimidating voice and he could hit the golf ball a mile. And I always found it tough working for Don when he was supervising the pro shop workers. Because, you see, Don, he drove us by withering criticism. That was just Don's style. Don would bark out, hey, who strapped Mac and Ernie's clubs on the passenger side of the golf cart? Everybody knows Mac wants to drive. Or else he'd say, hey, why are there still grass stains on Gillette's pitching wedge? Or maybe bark out, hey, who forgot to write down Hartman's bucket of range balls? Or maybe, hey, it's taking you way too long to find and pull down the player's bags from the warehouse rack. You see, under, under Don, I found myself, I was always tight and, and unconfident and slow-moving in fear of making a mistake that would cost me a verbal lashing. But then there were times when Don was out golfing 18 with a member. And Don wasn't around for about three and a half hours. And who was in charge of the pro shop? It was Tom. Tom was the caddy master. And Tom had a different way with us. Tom drove us not by criticism, but Tom drove us by encouragement. Tom would say, hey guys, how'd you get all those carts bagged and parked so fast? I, I like the way you lined them up there along the sidewalk, kind of like in formation. Looks like F-16 fighter planes ready to fly off on a mission. Or, or later Tom would say, that was really slick the way that you gripped Sheridan's five iron. Or maybe they need to say, I think you plucked clean all those balls from the driving range in, in near record time. You see, under Tom, attaboys always made me loose and confident and even creative and, and motivated to work by the anticipation of boosting praise of a good job. How do you want to supervise your kids? What, what, what is the atmosphere of the pro shop of your family. Scott, I'm going against you because I said you may be a lot like me. I don't know. But just ponder, ponder, ponder the implications of this. Are we, are we Barnabas-like encouragers or are we sometimes devil-like criticizers and accusers? There's a, an English gentleman who was really displeased with the way his kids had a propensity to sleep in late. And so 
he sought to encourage them to get up early. And at first he would criticize those who would stay in bed and call them slugs. But then after a while he said, a new, new, he says, okay, first one up every morning. They get, they get to be called lark all day. Lark is an early rising bird who sings sweetly. So the kids wanted to have the moniker of lark every day. So the kids would pop up really early. And you see the way that he drove them by encouragement. He drew them with the cords of affection. This kind of subtle attaboy strokes and smiles can animate a child's heart in pursuing excellence. About three years ago, I was golfing up in northern Michigan, and I was with a guy named Bruce who used to play NCAA golf for Kansas. Bruce was up there, and uh, about on the seventh hole, he paused before climbing out of the cart, and he, he sent a brief text message to his college-age daughter at a faraway campus. I said, what'd you write? He says, I told her I was thinking of her and that I love her. He looked at me and says, it's kind of like drip irrigation with these constant expressions of affection. He says, she thrives on my daily spoonfuls of, of affirmation and encouragement. It's like eye brightening honey. There was a sweetness to his fathering. And again, I know, I know, children do so many dumb things for hour, per hour. And you know what? I, again, I, I'm a child of my heavenly father, but, but I do so many dumb things for hour as well. But you know what I got? I, I, I deserve to be in outer darkness, weeping and wailing and gnashing my teeth. Instead, I drove out onto this peninsula, and I find that I got this beautiful Copas Lake. And I got this, this full suite that Lee signed me up for. And these puffy pillows. And these warm blankets. And these kind new friends. This is the way that my holy, holy, holy heavenly father has put me on better than drip irrigation. He's fire hosed me with his affirmations and kindnesses. And that ought to be, gentlemen, the keynote of our fathering with our children. So we're looking at the family implications of encouragement. We've seen for husbanding, for fathering, and now, last but not least, how about for grandfathering? For grandfathering. Scott, you'll like this one, because I'm keeping you awake, ain't I, Scott? <laughs> not because he wasn't sleeping, but we just had a great conversation beforehand in between. There's a guy named, there's a pastor named George McDiarmid, Scott, and he was a football coach. He has a football coach personality. And he's, uh, he, he's, he's a man who's a really gifted pastor in upstate New York. And he's a model father. And he's got only one son named Greg. And Greg benefited really well from his dad's coach-like spurring on to more levels of excellence in manhood. And Greg, Darius, where's Darius? Yeah, Greg played defensive back in high school. That's what Darius played over there at North Dakota State. Uh, it was in high school. Uh, it, there was a game that they had, and, and he didn't play very well, Greg told me about this. And uh, it was a big conference rivalry game. And afterward, uh, George said this. He said, he said Dad, he, my dad just read me the riot act. My dad just reminded me of the third quarter when the opposing tailback slipped by me for a touchdown and my dad scolded me and said, man, Greg, at least you could have shaken the man's hand when he blew by you. That was George, standard George. And then years later, Greg, the defensive back, moved to Louisville, Kentucky, and he finally had a son of his own whose name was Ian. And when Ian was about three years old, Grandpa George came down from New York to visit Kentucky for a week. And listen to this. Every day, Grandpa George took Ian for a ride to the nearby ice cream shop for an ice cream cone. Just, just the two of them. And at the week's end, Greg said to his dad, Dad, of, of, of all of my years as your son, you... you Maybe five times in my, in, but in, you gave to Ian five times in one week visits to the ice cream shop. And George said this, very calculatingly and very purposely, George said, that's because, Greg, because he was actually from Louisiana, that's because, Greg, 
I am not Ian's father. I am Ian's grandfather. And that's really perceptive. The old grandpa up front here. That's really perceptive. There is a difference between a father and a grandfather. You think about biblically, who is to be the heavy in the life of children? The primary heavy, which is honor your father and mother. That word honor is the Hebrew word kaved, which means take is heavy. So when I speak, let, not like I'm flicking to you a penny. It's like I'm tossing you a 40-pound salt bag. Heavy. Let, heavy. Who, who is to be the ultimate heavy in the life of a child? It's the person's father not the grandfather. And I needed to hear that in my life when I began to have grandkids. It says in Proverbs 13, 24, He who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him is careful to discipline him. Where's Landon? Landon nearby? Yeah, your dad is Scott. You may say, oh, now Pastor Chansky is going after my dad. He's put my dad in his place because my dad disciplines me. No, that's not what I'm saying, Landon. Oh, no. No, 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 because look what it says here. Correct your son and he will give you rest. Yes, he will delight your soul if you correct him. Or chasten your son while there is hope. Do not let his heart be set on destruction. He who spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is careful to discipline him. So don't think that your dad should become a feminine in his fatherhood. He needs, you need toughness and you need firmness. But I'm talking not to you, Landon, or your dad. I'm talking to the... Uh, this old gentleman up front here, and people like me who are grandpas. You see, yes, the dad is to be the heavy, but you know, grandparents, not so much. Not so much. We're not, we're not to be the heavies. Nature and Scripture teach us that grandparents are more assigned to be gracious and blessing benefactors than stern and disciplining rebukers. Where do you get that from, Mark? Well, just, just think with me. How about Genesis 48? It speaks of Jacob, Grandpa Jacob. He saw Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. He says, old man, he says, who are these? And Joseph said to his father, Jacob, these are my sons whom God has given me in this place. And he, Jacob says, bring them to me that I might what, Alan? Bring them to me that I might what? Bless them. Think of that man, that, that golfer from Kansas who put his daughter on drip irrigation when his granddaughter, Tej, was over, she was upstairs in the bedroom at bedtime, and she shouted down, Papa, Papa, come up and bless me. Because that's a Bruce, that's what I do to my grandkids. I bless my grandkids. Come up and bless me, Papa. See, that's the role of Jacob the grandpa that we see him as a patriarch. Also notice how it says in Proverbs 13, 22, a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. It's that giving, gracious, maybe it's ice cream cone, or maybe it's a special trip to see the minor league baseball game together. There's that element of, of grandpas being blessers. And this is an important concept because, you know, gentlemen, if you're like me, as we age, we can instinctively become chronically cranky. Or is that just me? We can become chronically cranky and constantly correcting critics. Both of our grandchildren, both of our grandchildren we can criticize and also are not so measuring up in their own parenting children of ours. And we can try to take on the rod of authority as if we were those grandchildren's father. Now, I understand in this generation when there are so many broken families and sometimes grandpas become the male figure in the life of the grandson, okay, granddaughter, okay, that's a different matter then. You have to take more on the persona of the actual parent. But I have seen the tragic fallout of abrasively confronting grandparents, burning bridges forever with their not-so-right-flying grandchildren. And instead of habitually serving up the refreshing talk of an ice cream cone interaction, Sometimes grandparents try to force down the throat some of this bitter asparagus that really is more of a dad's job and a mom's job than it is a grandpa and a grandma's job. In fact, my wife is a great example for me as I transition from father to grandfather. I remember when our firstborn grandchild, Richard, named after my dad, our firstborn grandchild, 
Richard, he was, he was spending a day at our house, and he was just inconsolably crying for no reason at all in my sight. And my instincts were to bark out, as I had done when I was a father, Hey, Richard, shut it! We don't do it here! But instead, Diane, my wise Abigail wife, enfleshed the Christ-like trait of a bruised reed he will not break and a smoking flax he will not snuff out. And she said, getting right down to eye level, Richard, 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 talk to Granny. What's the matter? What's the problem? And she found out he was hungry. And with only one little bit of yogurt and a strawberry on top, this inconsolable child became a very delightful child because the issue was fundamentally biological and it was not rebellion that was taking place. And then I remember even during an extended dinner, it was about a week later, where Austin was over at the house. And Austin was at the table, and Richard was not acting well, and Austin assessed what was going on. He didn't need yogurt, didn't need a strawberry. He needed to be picked up, taken off to the bedroom. He needed to have the rod landing. <laughs> He'd have the rod applied to him brought back, and there he was, a totally delightful child because he was disciplined. And then I, on Monday after that, said to Diane, man, Austin did an awesome job, didn't he, on Saturday at the dinner table. And I texted Austin, I said, you were the man on Saturday, the way that you handled Richard. Again, trying to affirm and find good things to praise and encourage. That's so interesting. Austin, Austin is the dad of uh, Richard. In fact, Austin, I was telling somebody, he was born, well, five months in the womb, we realized he had spina bifida. And we were told, you know, the guy probably won't, if he lives, he probably won't get out of a wheelchair. He'll need a shot in his head. He probably won't have bowel and bladder movement. And it's going to be really a sad situation. And then the first thing the, the uh, radiologist said is, Mr. Chansky, we have options. Recommendation was to, to terminate. Well, eventually, Austin was born, and, and long story short, Austin has a black belt in Taekwondo. In fact, Austin is our third born, and he now has, he early on had three children. Bam! 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 And the other older brothers didn't have any. I said, gentlemen, this is a competition, and Austin is trouncing y'all. So Austin, in fact, Part of Austin's greatness was his grandpa, Grandpa Chansky, Richard Chansky, my dad. And, and my dad was a, Scott, things about you remind me of my dad. My dad was a, was a high D guy. He was a, he was a man. And, but he's also a very, very tender guy. He would, he, would, he would take Austin under his wing, because a lot of my kids are really good athletes. Austin, not so much, because he runs a 5K, but he's really slow because he does have issues with his legs. But he would take Austin off to a ball game. He'd take Austin to play golf along. Yeah, he'd, he'd, do, he'd do ice cream with Austin. He was, he was just a real supporter of Austin, really an adrenaline injector into Austin's life. And sure, there were times my dad would say, hey, Austin, step into my office. And my dad, Scott, would say, step into my office. He was going to talk turkey. There'd be a little criticism that was going on, but it was always done in love. I still remember in, in, in 2001 when my dad died. In fact, the way that my dad died was uh, he, he was at, he had retired, he was a postmaster. He retired Mac from uh, post office and he took on a job at Furniture Showcase. And a part-time job. And so he, one Saturday morning, he had taken his nephew Kyle, who worked in the warehouse, and he was out, he, he vacuumed the whole showroom, and he was done vacuuming the showroom, he sat down in a wingback chair, just like this. See the wingback? This is the wingback chair. He sat down like this, and he took a little nap. And it turns out he had a massive heart attack as he sat there. And when Kyle, his grandson, came in from the warehouse, he checked Papa, and no, no pulse. Papa had died. Papa had gotten the swift, sweet cherry at home. Didn't have cancer, didn't have Alzheimer's. He got the swift seat cherry at home, but it just, just was like a, we lost this very precious uh, blesser in the lives of our family. I still remember at the funeral back in 2001, we were all sitting around and my dad was a 
character of man. We all be sharing stories. We kind of laugh to tears. And then, and then when all the adults were done talking, Austin chimes in. Austin was, boy, he's only about 11 years old at that time. And Austin chimes in and says, yeah, you know, regarding Papa, Papa was just always there. And it was just dead silence. It was one of those drop the mic moments. Because, because that's the kind of a dad that he was. And, and let's just kind of just conclude the whole, the whole time that we have together. You know, here we are, guys. We're talking about encouragement, adrenaline with the soul. We're talking about a face mask and lum- grabbing Lombardi, but also a hair messing up Lombardi. There are certain things you're remembered for. You know, my dad, when he sat down in that chair, he was remembered for being this mighty, well-rounded, well-contoured man of God. He was a Barnabas-like man. And, and yesterday when I got here, there was in my, uh, on my phone a little text from my daughter. Because Abby, my daughter, Abigail, I love that name and that persona, Abby married Jake. And Jake's dad is Bernie. And Bernie's my age. And when I got here, uh, the text said, Bernie had a massive heart attack. So I'm thinking to myself, i got a wingback chair in my room here. This one. And I just thought, I just sat down in this wingback chair and just thinking about, you know, so if I have my massive heart attack like my dad does, and, and remember Scrooge, when Scrooge died, remember there was a memory everybody had of Mr. Scrooge. Everybody had a memory of who he was. And he, and he, and he died to no man's sorrow, didn't he? Let me ask about you. I mean, here we are, we come, and for some reason, the Lord wanted this issue of encouragement to be addressed. Kind of grab you by the lapels. And let's talk a little bit about encouragement. Could it be that this is a timely thing? Matt talks about raised up for a time such as this. I'm so silly to think that Maybe for one person in these tan chairs, maybe one person in these tan chairs needs to be talked to about not being a Scrooge, but being a Barnabas. And just like Scrooge got dealt with by three angels in one day, and it transformed his life. You've been dealt with by three messages in one day. And could it be that before you sit down in your wingback chair, and don't boast you're going to be 71, because your chair of death may not be a wingback chair, but maybe it's a Ford F-150 bench that's in the parking lot right now, and you're going to drive home those 17 miles. Who says you're going to ever get out of that bench? You may end up having that be your, your dying lounge chair like that wingback chair was my dad's lounge. The point is, are you ready? Are you ready to die? We need to be ready to die, and die well, and die that we wouldn't die to no man's regret. What about your son's regret? What about your daughter's regret? You want him to be like like me when waking up at 3 o'clock in the morning, I lost my dad. May, May it be that we would live in such a way that we would die and have made an impact and an impress on our children that they would say, you know, my dad is my hero. And, and, you know, Scrooge, he'd messed it up, hadn't he? He'd messed it up. But look, it's a new day. And the Lord brought this time such as this for a reason. Don't waste it. Don't, don't waste the time here at Copas Lake. It's just you're driving home. Maybe, maybe just uh, stop in a parking lot somewhere. And maybe you had a tiff with your wife. Maybe you're foolish like me. You had a tiff with your wife. Wife. Before you get back and talk to her, stop in the parking lot and say, give me grace, give me mercy, not to be like the old man that I have been, but to be a new man in Christ Jesus. Let's pray in closing. Could you lead us, Steve, could you lead us in prayer and close us?
we struggle and stumble in many ways, Father, we just ask for more grace. Mm. Father, for mercy and strength, Lord, from on high. Mm. Help us, Father, to go forth and, and, Lord, just to be a blessing to those around us. Mm. Father, who knows what words of encouragement we might share. Mm. They, you know, just turn someone's life around. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Just make a real impact. Mm. And Father, help us not to have a wrong view of encouragement. Mm. You know, give them some reason for pride. But Lord, use these encouragements for good. Mm. Father, to build up, not to puff. Mm. Mm-hmm. Father, that we may be more like Christ. Mm. And so, Father, we just pray, be with us as we go. We thank you so much for this brother and, and the words that he has shared. Lord, bless him as he goes, Father. Um, we just thank you for him. We just give you praise.